This is Eyewitness News, Maryland's most complete television news service. With Jerry Turner, Al Sanders, and the Eyewitness News team. Good evening, everybody. Right now, the corruption case of former Governor Marvin Mandel remains in a holding pattern. There were, however, some anxious moments for Mandel this morning. The U.S. Supreme Court was expected to have ruled on a request for a review of his 1977 corruption conviction. But as George Bauman and Instant I learned, it was a false alarm. This much I knew as I went to the Mandel office. His request was scheduled for conference among the justices Friday. Supreme Court rulings usually come down on Monday mornings at 10. The Mandel ruling was expected. As I entered a few minutes past 10, I found Mrs. Mandel on the phone with a newspaper reporter who called to say, false alarm, no ruling today. Huh? <laughs> okay. Right, that's the word I got, and the only word we get is from you guys, so uh, it has to be the word. Oh, sure, we're working. We have stacks of work, so we're, and we're going to leave a little early because we're going to have Seder. And, and, but other than that, we'll be here tomorrow, too, okay? Wouldn't you like to know soon? Well, I would love to know. I would more than anything else love that would be favorable. Do you still hope it will be? Yes, Expect it will be? We're very hopeful that it will be. And if it isn't? Thank We've you. discussed it, and we know what the have future will be, we'll and we'll just have to go on and carry and on the best, the best we can. Mrs. Mandel handed the former governor a Passover card addressed to my governor and containing an affectionate message, to which Marvin Mandel responded. Then in his private office, Mandel received a call from his attorney, who had been told that it would be at least two weeks before the Supreme Court would rule. And Marvin Mandel would learn at last whether he will have one more chance to get his conviction overturned. And so I left, knowing I'd be back again before too long, but still not knowing exactly how or when the long Mandel odyssey will finally end. George Bauman, Channel 13, Eyewitness News. A Laurel man has been charged with murder and the shooting death of another man during a neighborhood dispute. That story tops tonight's crime beat. 42-year-old Raymond Clay is accused of killing 21-year-old George Webb. Police say they don't know what started the fight among the neighbors. Another man was wounded in that shooting. The Baltimore Police Department has made a decision today which could have a direct bearing on the recent case in which an off-duty officer in plain clothes shot what he thought was a robbery suspect. The department uh, says plain clothes officers are not required to identify themselves before shooting. Uh, in that most recent case, a teenager was shot when he reached for what the officer thought was a gun. Instead, it was a cigarette lighter. Well, right now, it's harder for consumers to get loans in Maryland than ever before. And soon, it'll become more expensive. Today, the state legislature passed a bill that raises the interest limit banks can charge on consumer loans of over $3,500 from 12% to 18%. Consumer Alert reporter Ellen Kingsley has details. With the current prime lending rate of 19.5%, banking officials say the bill may have little effect on them. Today, Equitable Bank stopped issuing consumer loans altogether. On Friday, we posted an effective prime rate of 19.5%, and with the ability of only getting 18% on consumer loans, it doesn't make any sense for us to be making these loans at 18%, with the prime rate at 19.5%. Meaning that if you make consumer loans at 18%, you are losing money. That's exactly right. Today's move is the second by Equitable's Consumer Loan Department. About a month ago, the bank stopped issuing loans of over $3,500 because they can only charge 12% on those. But even though they can now charge 18% on those and 18% on loans above $3,500, they say it's still not worth it to lend to consumers. Right at this time, it would not change our immediate policy on loans, but we feel that as things get back to a more normal situation, that it would have a, a very beneficial effect to us getting back into the market. When will things get back to normal, do you think? Uh, Ellen, I really couldn't tell you that. Uh, we have not been correct in our assumptions in the past. Uh, we are just waiting to see how things go. And from all indications, things may not go well. Equitable may just be the first of many banks to stop consumer lending. 
that will probably result in a slowdown in consumer purchasing and in a general slowdown of the entire economy, which is exactly what the Carter administration is trying to accomplish. Ellen Kingsley, Channel 13, Eyewitness News. The bill takes effect July 1st, and Ellen says it will also make it more expensive to use our credit cards, raising the amount on which banks can charge 18% interest on from the first $500 to the first $700. And while the credit crunch is tightening, so is the job market. That's a result of the new Carter budget cuts. Under the Carter plan, 61,000 public service jobs would be eliminated, saving $600 million. Altogether, the president is calling for a billion dollars worth of uh, job-related cuts in the Labor Department. That's just another sign of a possible recession. The latest government index shows that the U.S. economic activity fell for the fifth straight month. A consecutive five-month drop historically has receded a longer economic decline. This will be coupled with a Carter budget cut of $15 billion and almost equal amount of new taxes. A controversial economic matter continued today at the Maryland State Legislature. The Senate Budget and Taxation Committee approved the $22 million bonding bill for Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. The bill, which would provide bonds to finance additions and improvements to the stadium, is expected to get full Senate approval. 16-year-old Marvin uh, Moore never quite made it to school this morning. An argument outside of Douglas High School prompted a shooting incident, which left Moore with a superficial gunshot wound of the chest. Marvin Moore was shot once in the chest this morning around 9 at this Douglas High School entrance after getting into an argument with a Douglas 10th grade student. Moore, instead of seeking help inside the school, somehow made it home to the 2100 block of Brookfield where he called Douglas High School Principal Earl Hagen to report the shooting. This is what amazes me because the only inkling I had that something might have been wrong was one student who's an office aide who suggested that I check down at the front door area and I did that saw no evidence. The young man apparently had been injured by this time, but he went home rather than coming to the school building, which makes me wonder how seriously he was injured. Thank heaven it wasn't too serious for him to get back home again. Moore was lucky. The bullet grazed his chest. He was treated and released from Maryland General Hospital. The police are now looking for a Douglas High School 10th grader who may be responsible for the shooting. Complicating the search for the suspect is the fact that the victim knew only his attacker's first name. Several students in the school have that name. The well, Baltimore police are now investigating the death of a city jail inmate who died from a drug overdose. Another inmate found a 28-year-old Horace Fletcher in his cell, a hypodermic syringe at his side. Police say there is no evidence of foul play and have yet to identify the drug involved. Police are now awaiting the results of an autopsy to determine what caused the death of an Annapolis man whose body was found in a dump this morning. Police theorize that the body had been in one of the many large dumpsters that are unloaded daily at the Annapolis landfill. It was discovered by a bulldozer operator who had been leveling piles of trash. And he said he couldn't believe what he saw. No, because I've never seen nothing like it before. <laughs> Not enough garbage. I've seen everything else, though. Although police identified the body as that of an Annapolis man they believed to be a drifter, they did not immediately release his name because relatives uh, had not been notified. Police do not know how he got into the trash dumpster or whether he was alive or dead when the dumpster was unloaded. Tonight, the Eyewitness News I-Team reports that Baltimore City Police have charged the president of a small heating oil company with siphoning off thousands of gallons of oil from a public school in Baltimore City. The company was under contract with the school system and had just made a delivery the day before. The I-Team's Dave Bryan tells us the oil company official was arrested after school officials discovered more than 6,000 gallons of heating fuel missing from two different schools on the same day. This is one of the schools where the oil was discovered missing, the Langston Hughes Elementary School at Reisterstown Road and Nelson Avenue. Every morning at each of the almost 200 public schools in Baltimore City, the school engineer walks out and with a stick, he actually measures the amount of oil in the fuel tank by sticking the stick right down in this pipe here. Just like a homeowner could do at his own home to make sure he gets the correct amount of oil with each delivery. In the case of this building, on a particular morning, uh, the end of January, I believe it was, uh, the engineer measured and found that it was substantially different from the reading he had gotten the day before. So you took the daily reading for the school and for the other school, uh, and when you noticed such a big difference, you knew something was wrong. That's right. Now, the, the building has an operating engineer, and that's his first duty of the day. 
Last month, police charged David Jackson of the Brock Fuel Oil Service on Ingleside Avenue with driving up with his oil truck and siphoning out and stealing almost 3,000 gallons of fuel from the Langston Hughes Elementary School the day after his company had delivered the oil. Although there's no sign or marking, the offices of Brock Fuel Oil Service are in this building behind me here. When we arrived this afternoon, David Jackson, the president of the company, was not in, but Mrs. Jackson was. And she said Brock Fuel Oil Service had done nothing wrong and that the company was being picked on, although she didn't want to say it on camera. Dave Bryan, Channel 13 Eyewitness News in Westview. The medical report tonight on the Shah of Iran differs somewhat from the version given by Dr. Michael DeBakey following recent surgery to remove the Shah's spleen. DeBakey had said at the time the Shah should be playing tennis again shortly. But tonight, a medical bulletin from Cairo says the Shah's cancer has now spread to his liver. He will continue to undergo chemotherapy treatments in a Cairo hospital. The legendary U.S. Olympic star Jesse Owens died today of lung cancer in Arizona at the age of 66. Owens was catapulted to fame with his Olympic performance in Germany as Adolf Hitler looked on. At those games, he established world records in several categories and won four gold medals. Owens had been a pack-a-day smoker for 35 years. Charges are pending tonight in an accident involving an MTA bus and two other vehicles. MTA officials say bus number 144 collided with a parked van on a Harford Road this morning, pushed the van into another parked car, and ended up on the lawn across the street. Nobody was injured in the accident, which happened around 9 o'clock this morning. Bus drivers, school officials, and students in Anne Arundel County are trying to work out their differences. The negotiations were sparked by driver complaints about how students are disciplined. The drivers also want to be granted formal hearings before they are suspended. The driver's complaint surfaced after one driver was suspended last year because he got a speeding ticket. Well, if you haven't gotten your new license tags by now, you're in big trouble. You must have them on your car by midnight tonight. Frank Luber and Instant Eye found a few procrastinators in line getting their tags today, but there weren't as many last-minute applicants as usual. Compared to other years, this was a breeze. True, there were the usual last-minute motorists rushing to get their new tags on the very last day. But this year was different, and for the best for all concerned. There were no lines at all at the Motor Vehicles Administration in Glen Burning, a five-minute wait, if that. At Mundalman, a line, but nothing like other years. Here, the wait was 20 minutes at best, and some of the faces seemed familiar. Is this the first time you waited this long? Uh, yes, it is. Indeed it is, yeah. Just got back from Florida, 
and that's the only reason I even came back. Just, just to get, get your tags. Just to get my tags right. I want you all to know I'm standing out here in the rain because there was nothing else to do down here. How about you? Why'd you wait so long? I didn't have the $30. <laughs> that's a good enough reason now. <laughs> Last minute again, huh? <laughs> yeah. I Last see you here every year. Not every year. <laughs> How about you? Why do you wait so long? Well, I missed around. Should have been here down here two weeks ago, but <laughs> late. You just wanted the day off, that's right. That's what that's what that's what that's what it was. Thing last year and then end up being right back here again. I and said it rain this year. Rain again this year too. Also. <laughs> hey everybody. <laughs> As of this final day for getting your new tags on, there were some 100,000 motorists still delinquent. Again, better than normal. There had to be a reason, and MVA officials came up with two of them. This is a license plate issuance here. Uh, any year we found where we issue license plates, you get a bit uh, more extra attention in the press, in television, radio, and newspapers. We've all seen a lot of the stories. Second reason is, the very conspicuous nature of the change, license plates as opposed to stickers, provides a constant visual reminder to the motorist who hasn't yet secured his license plates. He gets in his car, he sees the car in front of him with the new plates, and he then thinks to myself, uh, my gosh, I've got to get my new license plates on. The biggest complaint this year seemed to evolve around the plates themselves, black numbers and letters on white. Bland, said some, terrible, said others. MVA officials called it austere, but clearly identifiable. But for the complainants, there is hope. The MVA is currently studying the possibility of a new tag, one that will last 10 years instead of five, and one with some spiffy graphics like the Free State, America in miniature, and even Home of Blaze Star, all considerations. Whatever's decided could become a reality as early as next year. I'm Frank Luber, Channel 13 Eyewitness News with Instant Eye. Once again, I must have my new tags on the car by midnight tonight. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And if that's not bad enough, your census form is supposed to be turned in by April 1st. Now, that's tomorrow. Census Bureau officials say it will take months before the results of the questionnaires can be completely tabulated. They're also expecting about 20% of the American public to miss tomorrow's deadline. So census takers will be out in force trying to locate people who don't respond. Voters go to the polls in Kansas and Wisconsin tomorrow. Kansas Senator Robert Dole, who withdrew from the presidential race two weeks ago, is backing Ronald Reagan. Republican John Anderson says he's moving closer and closer to running as an independent. Wisconsin is known for stunning election upsets. That could mean another big win for Senator Kennedy over President Carter. Tonight, a small but ever-growing uh, crowd of sympathizers is throwing the Kennedy for President campaign into high gear in Maryland. Steve Frazier is on hand today as they open their headquarters here. Three, two, one, yeah! Ted Kennedy's Maryland campaign headquarters opened simply and without a lot of fanfare today. And that's how the entire Maryland campaign will likely run. State coordinator Jim Flug told me there's no money from the national campaign here. It's all volunteer time and effort now. That may change soon because the state is now perceived as pivotal to the campaign. Because of the timing where it comes in, in the uh, delegate selection process, we're before uh, California and some of the big delegate states, and uh, we can keep that big mo uh, called momentum going. And then second, because Maryland is really the state uh, in as American miniature, and it reflects the broad-based support that we think uh, Kennedy would have. Congresswoman Mikulski is the best known of Marylanders active in the Kennedy campaign. Since the victories in New York and Connecticut, almost 300 people have signed on as volunteer workers. They'll do the door-to-door -door work that means so much. Maryland Kennedy supporters will have to make do with pictures of their candidate and visits by other members of his family until April 9th. But he will be here then. April 9th, a fundraising dinner is scheduled here. And in the weeks before Maryland's May 13th primary, the national campaign might send down cash in organizers. Otherwise, it's all grassroots. Steve Frazier, Channel 13 Eyewitness News. Still to come, Marty Bass has his exclusive AccuWeather forecast. And a special night for Jews around the world. Kevin Brown has a live, instant eye story on Passover. Coming up next, right here on Channel 13's Eyewitness News.
Well, if you have to have a rainy Monday, you should also have to have a little Martin Bass, because that helps. Why? <laughs> it brightens is that the like, day. Is that like that's the tenderizer like, on top of some bad chuck? Something no, that's like, like that, yes. Like that fellow said, the show must go on. I only think. You know, I, Why? I, I haven't <laughs> put my plates on either, and I just realized <clears throat> something. You and I are going to be out in the parking lot tonight holding umbrellas for each other. I have an old car, and they are rusted on after five oh, years. have yeah. to be cut off. There's really, there's no way those bolts are going to come yeah. out. So Ernest Ainsley couldn't get those, get those bolts off my bumper, let me tell you. I don't know about that, but... <laughs> anyway, it looks like the rain's going to continue <laughs> no through the night. <laughs> you got to get your plates on and you can wait if you don't have to be into work until like, you know, 11, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. You could be in there. We're expecting some light clearing, but otherwise tonight is really going to be miserable. And I hate to say this to you, northern Baltimore County, southern Pennsylvania, look out for some snowflakes. Oh. Talk about that in just a second. Right now on TV Hill after a high today of 46 degrees at the airport, 49 in the city, it's now 43, 6 Celsius, the humidity is 83%. Winds from a northerly direction, 9 miles an hour, barometric pressure is rising now from 29.74. The air quality today, one of the good portions of the day, 33, and that was good. Tides tomorrow morning, 105 a.m. the low, about 6 hours later, your high tide. Sunrises tomorrow morning, 9 minutes before 6 o'clock. Instant I was out today in the rain and the gore, and literally, that's what it was. Nothing but rain and nothing but gore. Not a beautiful day. This month, we've had four inches of rain. The best part of that rain has come in the past five days, and it looks like it's just not going to stop for any appreciable length of time for about another week. I'm sick about it, too. Let's take a look at the satellite in graphic detail. You'll be able to see it right here. This is one of the big storm centers controlling our weather. Actually, what we got going, low pressure right over the uh, Maryland area, a little stationary front. There's a lot of warm air that would like to come up. It's just not making it and another low pressure system over the Ohio Valley. Between the two of them, nothing but a band of rain all across northern tier states on eastern half. Down to our south, as has been the case over the past four or five days, warm air, sunny skies, it just is not able to get up to us. Right now, live sky is going to show us that the rain has gotten to us, particularly in our area. Now, we take a look down to our south. We've got a rather heavy swath of rain. You folks in the south and southwestern counties are getting it now. This whole system's moving in an easterly direction, so I doubt that the heavy rains will get above Baltimore City, but still, uh, it's going to be a relatively miserable night throughout much of the city, and once again, we're not expecting the rains to stop. Bedtime for us. When it stays out into the ocean, right off of the coast, the clouds inevitably spill inland, and tomorrow, even though we might see some sunny skies, we're still going to have a cloudy day. Let's take a look at tomorrow's map. You'll be able to see the progression of the whole system. By this time tomorrow, we're not even going to show the low on the map, but still, our winds will be coming from just enough of a northerly direction to keep clouds along the coast and keep our temperatures down below like the 60-degree level. Uh, they should be about 58 degrees. That's our normal high for this time of the year. That is not going to happen. Very weak high pressure down to our south up to our north is not going to help us out at all. Our next big major weather system, a low pressure system over Oklahoma, this whole shooting match is moving up. You guessed it. One decent day, a lousy day, and followed by another lousy day, then maybe a decent day, and it looks right now like the weekend for next weekend could be rain. I'm sick about it. We'll talk about that in about a half an hour. Right now in the state, 39 degrees, cloudy skies in Oakland, 44 in Salisbury, 43 degrees down in OC, 42 now in Brooklyn Park. Variable winds on the bay tomorrow. Let's call them from a southeasterly direction, 10 to 20, with a 1 to 2 foot wave chop. The Almanac, one year ago today in the old line state. Let's change it from free state. It was kind of warm. High of 83, low of 60, thunder showers. The 83 degrees was not a record for the date that was set in 1945 when the entire last week in March temperatures were above 80 degrees. Let's look at the exclusive active weather forecast for tonight. Misty, damp, chilly. Overnight low tonight at 38 degrees. Once again, you folks in northern Baltimore County, southern Pennsylvania, you could see some snow flurries, no accumulation expected tomorrow. Variably cloudy. See the, sun's, the sun will come at times, but nothing great. High of 53 degrees. Men, that's the picture from the weather department. There is a bleak picture, Martin. No. <laughs> sure is, and you know, white with a big dot on it, and that's yes. it. Yes. Well, so much for the weather, Albert. Yes. Let's Glad move past that part. <laughs> right along. <laughs> Jewish people around the world are getting ready to celebrate Passover. The eight-day holiday begins tonight with the first Seder meal. Kevin Brown is now live with Instant Eye and more on this Passover celebration. Our friends and relatives have gathered here at the home of Dr. Barry Lever and his family in Pikesville to celebrate the Seder, the most celebrated holiday in the Jewish religion. Jews all over the world are observing. The celebration goes back to when Moses led the Jews this from Egypt 3,200 years ago. 
The ceremony begins with the Kiddush, a prayer said by the head of the household. It's followed by short prayers by other family members and a number of other symbolic gestures. Next year we celebrate Passover here. Next year may we celebrate it in the land of Israel. This year many of our people still are not free. Next year at this time may they and all men everywhere enjoy the blessing of full freedom. Once Seder is celebrated tonight, another will be celebrated tomorrow. The entire holiday lasts eight days. During this time, by the way, the only kind of bread the family eats is unleavened bread, symbolizing that when the Jews escaped from slavery in Egypt, they had no time to leaven the bread they took with them. The family will also eat from a plate containing a number of symbolic foods. For example, bitter herbs symbolizing the bitterness of slavery, a green vegetables symbolizing the springtime, which is when the Seder is held. Incidentally, the Seder's closeness to Easter is more or less coincidence. The only real relationship is that the last supper of Christ, the supper before his crucifixion, was a Passover supper, and so is this one. Al? All right, Kevin, thank you very much. That's Kevin Brown with a live, instant-eye look at Passover. Still to come, a mother and her son are reunited. Richard Cher has that Instant Eye story. And a mysterious rash has some officials puzzled. Aaron Moriarty and Instant Eye have details coming up next right here on Channel 13's Eyewitness News. City health and school officials are still puzzled by the continu continuing reports of a mysterious rash that has affected several of the students and teachers attending a junior high school in South Baltimore. Erin Moriarty is a brand new member of our Eyewitness News family and here is her report. Investigators from the Baltimore City Health Department were in Francis Scott Key Junior High School today trying to find the cause of the rash. Over 60 students and two teachers have complained of similar symptoms since the rash was first noticed by students last Wednesday. The symptoms, as it stands now, are itching, scratching, uh, lacrimation of the eye. Meaning what? Uh, causing tears. And now it appears that it's only affecting ninth graders and then maybe two adults. Why just ninth graders? Any theories? We, we don't know. Uh, rooms 201 to 11, 209 seems to be the, the area in which uh, we're getting this particular condition. According to the school principal, Rudolph DePaula, only 10 students reported the symptoms today, down from a high of 30 on Friday. But the low number may be a result of the fact that some parents, like Mrs. Francis Mosca, either kept their children at home or actually took them out of the school today. I called the school trying to find out what was going on in the school Friday. And I was told that the condition Friday was still there today. So I requested that my daughter be sent home. 
And how long do you plan to keep her at home? I plan on keeping her home until the school or the school board can tell us exactly what is going on in the school and what it is. The most popular theory seems to be that there's something in the classrooms that is causing the rash. Well, authorities should know more tomorrow because all three classrooms, room 201, 209, and 211, will be completely clean tonight. With your instant eye, I'm Erin Moriarty, Channel 13 Eyewitness News. That string of deliberately set fires in Baltimore schools last week is apparently carrying over into this week. The one alarm fire in the University of Baltimore's library yesterday is being called arson. The fire destroyed cartons full of books and caused seven people to be treated and released from area hospitals for minor injuries. The fire was contained to a basement storage area of the university. Right now, a mother and her son are catching up on their lives. They've been separated for 26 years and have just been reunited in Baltimore. Richard Chair and Instant I were there with them today in Woodlawn. 26 years ago, Deanna Perry, then 15 years old, gave birth to a son whom she turned over to Catholic Charities for adoption. When he turned 26, March 23rd, Timothy Smith, living in Highlandtown, vowed to find his natural mother. He petitioned the courts in Baltimore, and at the end of last week, was able to trace his mother, now Deanna Perry Longo, to her home south of San Francisco. Last Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock Pacific time, Deanna Longo, after 26 years of wanting to know, talked on the telephone with her son Timothy. It was brief, and my son wanted to know if I wanted to see him, and if we, any way possible, we could get together. And I said, we'll get together. So we got together. How do you feel? Fantastic. Did you? I feel great. It's like I told her at the airport yesterday, a long time to see. <laughs> mm. It's been 26 years. And uh, I just turned 26, and this is just about the best birthday present I could have had. Really is. It's just been too long. Timothy says he hopes to leave Baltimore to live with his mother and her husband in Saratoga, California. It's what he wants to do. As for his adopted mother in Highland Town, says Timothy, she is trying to understand. Deanna hopes she does. And people that don't believe in miracles, give them my phone number because miracles do happen. Richard Scher, Channel 13, Eyewitness News. About 25,000 Baltimore walkers have already signed up to join the March of Dimes battle against birth defects. Baltimore has had the largest response in the nation to the walk since the, uh, the first, even though it was held in the city, and that was back in 1974. This year's walk, nearly 22 miles, is expected to raise more than $650,000 contributed to the March of Dimes birth defects campaign last year. The bodies of the American boxing team, all victims of that recent Polish air crash, were flown to Andrews Air Force Base today for a memorial service. Eyewitness News reporter Val Himes was there. The rain fell hard on the hangar where the caskets carrying Bernard Callahan and his fellow boxing team members were brought for the service. Their families, here at the expense of the Polish government, joined State Department, Polish and White House officials to hear prayers, music and messages from the Polish government, the President and Cyrus Vance. The Ambassador, our nations are joined in sadness. Vance, our young boxers were our ambassadors. The President sent his nephew with a special message for the family saying, they represented what is best in our country. They were proud young men, and they made us proud to have them fight for us. On behalf of the country, I would like to thank you for raising such fine young people. The service ended in silence, but some of the parents lingered, searching the long line of caskets for the one holding their son. Valheim, Channel 13, Eyewitness News, Washington.
Hello. Now then, Klaus Wagner is with us for tonight's sports report. Now, Albert, I know you're a big fan of uh, pugilistic arts. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> you really are. I, no, I, I, I do too much fighting in our house. I don't need to watch people get paid for that. No, well, I'll it tell really you. does. I get all worked up with that. I, I do. You do? Uh, I you really do. I really do. I, it's, uh, I think you will probably be able to see more punches thrown tonight. Yeah. Then on a good Saturday night down in Fells Point. We going home with Al? Or in the Eyewitness Sports <laughs> Department. <laughs> yeah, we're going to stay on here and take night. the calls from Fells Point. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> ABC has really put together uh, four televised title bouts, uh, as good as any in recent memory. Now, the one with the most local interest will be the uh, WBC World Welterweight title bout between Sugar Ray Leonard and Davey Boy Green from England. This is his first time here in the country. Now, Leonard makes his first title defense since taking the crown last November, and this one shouldn't really be much of a problem. Green's a good fighter, but not in the class of Sugar Ray Leonard. And here's how the uh, two fight managers see this one. I see a great fight. I see a great evening because, you know, you got a perfect blending of styles. You couldn't ask for a better blending of styles. If it goes 15, I won't be amazed. Uh, if, if, if a knockout comes, it'll come late, and I feel that Ray will be the administrator of the knockout. It's going to be a tough fight. This is a pure battle of styles, and the style of boxers is the thing that makes some great boxers look mediocre because of the style of the opposition. This is a, a Frazier v. Ali type fight, and I think it's going to be one hell of a contest, really. This one shouldn't even go five rounds. Also on the card, Marvin Johnson defending his WBA light heavyweight crown against Eddie Gregory. This was Johnson taking the title from Victor Galindez last year. On the heavyweight side, John Tate, the WBA champ, meets Mike Weaver, uh, who gave Holmes quite a scrap last year. This was Tate in one of his easier bouts against Cali Canutze. Tate will be the light heavyweight WBA championship. Uh, Marvin Johnson, that is not right. Marvin Johnson against Eddie Gregory. That fight from Knoxville, Tennessee. That's an 8 o'clock start. And then the 9 o'clock fight, the WBA light heavyweight title, John Tate against Mike Weaver, also from Knoxville. The third fight will be the WBC welterweight title, Sugar Ray Leonard against Davey Green, a 10 o'clock start from the Capitol Center. And then at 11 o'clock, the final fight, Larry Holmes against Leroy Jones for the WBC World Heavyweight title. There we see it uh, again from Las Vegas. So two from Knoxville, one from Capitol Center, and the one from Vegas. Orioles have to be asking themselves what they have to do to win a ball game. They dropped their seventh straight today, a 1-0 heartbreak loss to the White Sox. Uh, Palmer started, worked six strong innings, so at least he is coming around, gave up six hits and the only the one run. And then Stewart uh, retired six straights in the seventh and the eighth. Rich Wortham got the win, so they are now 7-12 and 12 with the Royals next on the schedule tomorrow at Fort Myers. Flanagan will get the start in that one. Now, during the past few days, there's been a lot of concern among the Orioles and the fans about the condition of the right arm of Denny Martinez. He's been complaining of some tightness. Randy Blair says the club doctors aren't really that worried. Dennis was in Baltimore today and was examined by orthopedic consultant Dr. Edmund McDonald and later saw team physician Dr. Leonard Wallenstein for routine tests. It's somewhat ironic that the arm trouble comes in a year when Martinez didn't pitch winter ball and that may have caused the problem. It's thought that he really has a very sound arm and that there is not a serious problem involved. Uh, we think that he strained some muscles in the deltoid area in his right shoulder and uh, it may be that uh, he's progressed a little too rapidly in his training program. Dr. Wallenstein adds it's unlikely that Dennis will be able to go nine innings by the season opener but with proper conditioning and some heat treatments he'll be back on the Memorial Stadium turf shortly barring of course a strike. Randy Blair Channel 13 Eyewitness Sports. Okay, tomorrow afternoon in Dallas, the player reps will meet and determine a strike date. Now, I doubt that they will walk right away, probably tease us all a little bit with three or four weeks of baseball and then take a hike sometime in Maine. In any case, Randy Blair is on his way to Dallas to cover the meetings, and he'll have his report tomorrow night. A couple of deals made today. The Expo sent Rusty Staub to the Rangers for a couple of players, and the Red Sox picked up journeyman catcher Dave Rader from the Phillies for cash or a player to be named later. So it doesn't sound very optimistic for a healthy Carlton Fisk for the Boston Red Sox. Roger the Dodger, Staubach, uh, finally called his own play today for years taking signals from the sidelines, which didn't really take a lot away from his uh, talent. Staubach today called his own number down and out, out of football. Now at the news conference uh, down in Dallas, Roger was visibly taken emotionally. Roger with the Dodger. Of course, the nuts and bolts of the Dallas Cowboys is... Uh... <laughs> A man that wears a funny hat. 
on the sidelines. I wasn't going to do this, but uh, Tom Landry is the nuts and bolts, and I appreciate him. He's going to be missed. He led the Colts, or the uh, club, to two Super Bowl titles, and four times he was the NFL's top all-around quarterback. Roger retiring at the age of 38. Colts started a little house cleaning today by uh, putting nine-year veteran defensive back Norm Thompson on waivers. Thompson came to the Colts in 77 from the Cardinals, benched by March Broda in 78. Then when Nettles was finally benched for poor play, Thompson came back in. But I think with the play of the new rookies, Brazil and Glasgow, and now Anderson coming back, Thompson uh, became expendable. Bullets right down to the wire before clinching that final NBA playoff spot with a win over the Nets yesterday. The bullet win tied them with the New York Knicks, but the Bullets had a better Eastern Conference record. Consequently, they make the playoffs. Unsell came through with a good performance. The Knicks hung in there, came back from a large deficit uh, thanks to some hot shooting from Cliff Robinson. In the second half, the Big E, Elvin Hayes right here from, from the outside, got hot. He finished with 14. Uh, the Nets lost the final score 93 to 87. The Bullets will scramble into the playoffs. Uh, they take on the 76ers starting this Wednesday in Philadelphia for the best of three. And that's going to be tough. Doug Toole won the Randy Lade Heritage Golf Tournament. He and Jerry Pate wound up with uh, tied after 72 holes. And on the first sudden death hole, Toole uh, got a par. Pate ended up with a bogey. It's Toole's first win in five years on the tour, worth $54,000. It was nice to see Nancy Lopez Melton uh, win her first tournament of the year over the weekend. Uh, she won the LPGA Kemper Open in Costa Mesa by a couple of strokes. At Pimlico today, the final three in the seventh, 1A, Go Bonkers. And Anita's Darlin, the 1-7 uh, pay $26.40. The eight, Champagne Star, two on one, $38 for the 6-4. And the ninth, Triple, Oogie Wawa, four reasons. And Foxy Girl, I just call him, I don't name him. 8 4 10 $3,906. And congratulations to uh, Charlie Fenwick of Baltimore for winning the Grand National Steeplechase in England over the weekend. We'll try to talk to him later on this week. That's sports, Al. Thank you, Klaus. Well, tonight, a woman who has been an inspiration to children for almost uh, four decades is wearing a goal 13. Richard Chair has more. Channel 13 salutes Francis Gleichman who's been a devoted Baltimore City school teacher for the past 37 years. The last 21 here at the Violetville School number 226. Mrs. Gleitman is a very creative, wonderful teacher and Violetville School is very fortunate to have her on her staff. And the children and parents agree. Teachers like Frances Gleitman are hard to find. She's very creative and the boys and girls respond by paying attention in class and by working very hard on their projects. And say the children, even when someone is a little bad in class, Mrs. Gleichman never raises her voice. She is very special, and I could feel sincere mutual affection among the students and their teacher. We want Mrs. Gleichman to get the Channel 13 salute because she's kind, she cares about how we do her work, and she's one of the best teachers we've ever had. Well, she's very nice, and she does different projects with us, and that's why I think she ought to get it. Well, she cares about us, and she cares how we're going to pass to Rockland or whatever other school we're going to. She cares, like, how we're going to pass. She cares um, what we do, and she's really a nice teacher. Well, first, I want to say I was very shocked and very surprised, and I'm certainly glad that I knew a little bit ahead of time that this was going to happen to me, because I really think we've gotten along really beautifully in our class, and I really thank them for this opportunity. And now, Francis, on behalf of all of us at Channel 13 and all of your friends at the Violetville School, I pin the gold 13 on this fine bouquet of flowers that you've been given for this occasion to congratulate you for 37 years of teaching wonderful boys and girls just like this. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Uh, if you know someone who deserves a gold 13, write and tell us about that person. Send your letter to 13 Salute, WJZ TV, Television Hill, Baltimore, Maryland, 212. One, one. Still to come, silver prices are faring better. We'll have details. And consumer alert reporter Ellen Kingsley has the latest on a once popular Baltimore health spa. Coming up next, right here on Channel 13's Eyewitness News.
Three months ago, a popular Baltimore health spa closed up, leaving hundreds of lifetime members holding the bag. Well, Consumer Alert reporter Ellen Kingsley has been following that story, and tonight she has the latest on it. Well, the latest, Jerry, is that the Grecian Spa in Cockeysville is still closed. And from the looks of things, that's the way it's going to stay. But members say they're not going to sit back and take it. Right now, they're taking action. Shortly after the Grecian Spa closed its doors in January, about 30 members came to meet with me and complain. Many of them had paid well over $500 for lifetime memberships. Some of them had used the spa for less than a year. I'm still making payments at this point in time, and I'm not being supplied with any type of services or any type of spa facilities. I'm very concerned about stopping my spa payments for two reasons. I'm just now in the process of establishing my credit, and I am paying a credit agency, so I'm concerned about ruining my credit rating. The spa closed as a result of legal wranglings when the spa's owners, Lewis and Peggy Andrews, divorced. But because spa members were not taken care of, that meant even more legal trouble for the Andrews. Last month, the Attorney General's Office of Consumer Protection filed suit against Grecian to get members their money back. But that suit is not scheduled to go to court until June 2nd. A lot of Grecian spa members got a little fed up with waiting. So what about a dozen of them have done is file suit in small claims court. Linda Friedman, who heads an association of disgruntled Grecian members, filed her small claim suit last week. Well, I spoke to the attorney general's office and they said that the court case was coming up in June, but they were filing for a violation of Maryland consumer law. And this, not, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that we'll get money back and you know, maybe a small fee but you know we won't really get restitution we're going to hopefully call a meeting and tell everyone to go through small claims court and you know this was suggested by the uh, attorney general's office that you know, we would probably get a little more for our money doing it this way than you know waiting for him there's also a good possibility that another company Excuse will me. take over the facilities Right now, workmen are renovating the place, and both Nautilus and Holiday Spas Electrical are talking to the landlord about the landlord. signing a lease. Both told me they'd give some consideration to Grecian members, but as yet, there's no exact word on what that will be. It could be as long as five months before the facilities reopen, and a lot of members have already joined other spas. They're pretty upset, frustrated. Um, a lot of them feel that they don't want to join any other spas because they're afraid that the same thing will happen to them. Leaders of the health spa industry don't want Grecian members to develop the attitude that the whole industry is like this, so the industry association president, who is also the president of holiday spas, has very graciously offered to allow Grecian members to use holiday facilities if they can't regain membership at the Cockeysville location after about 60 days. And I think after about 60 days, most of these people will be good and ready for a health spa experience. No well, I guess uh, in this case, uh, as in the case of any business that uh, closes, a, a lifetime membership to it doesn't mean too much. I yeah. think that if you're considering joining a health spa, you ought to figure out what lifetime membership means. Does that apply to you or does it apply to the spa? What if the spa only lasts a year? You can't expect a spa to be around for the rest of your life. It's just not going to happen. You're probably better off joining for a limited period. Yeah. Okay, Ellen, thank you very much. Well, the fast foods you're buying may not be what you think they are. Language on some restaurant menus don't match what comes out of the kitchen. According to government studies, you may be uh, getting frozen orange concentrate instead of fresh orange juice or any old potato labeled Idaho potatoes. Consumer groups say they're worried whether Americans are getting what they pay for. Incidentally, government figures indicate one out of every four dollars spent on food last year went toward meals away from home. Well, after last week's rush and panic selling, the price of silver opened the week steady in world markets. Silver closed to just about $14.70 an ounce in New York. The New York Stock Exchange took another sharp jump today after a strong rally on Friday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed up slightly more than eight points. Still to come, Marley Bass, exclusive five-day AccuWeather forecast. And a local band tries to get into the Guinness Book of World Records. Coming up next, right here on Channel 13, Eyewitness News.
Now with a five-day forecast, and Marty Bass, and it doesn't look too good, but Marty will try to make it sound uh, as pleasant as possible. Marty? Let's get on with the pleasantries. Beautiful area, some nice big old heavy rain down in southern Anne Arundel County. Once again, we've got some rain out to our west, and we're expecting it to rain throughout the Baltimore area throughout the at least the next two, two and a half hours. But be advised, you folks down in southern Anne Arundel County, some heavy, some rather heavy showers coming your way. Let's take a look at the old five-day forecast. Not really too bad tomorrow. It should be clearing in the afternoon, up to 53 degrees. Wednesday looks nice now, up to 60. Rain coming in Wednesday afternoon, continuing through Thursday and Friday. Bad news, 60 and 57. Clearing up for your Saturday, Albert, 53 degrees, partly cloudy skies. Got to plan something for that great day there. That, well, you know, dynamite. We'll figure it out. All right, Martin. Eight seconds may not seem like much in many sports, but it meant everything to the sportsmen who tops our look at people making news tonight. Jim Lamberton is a bull rider from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He tried to win the Longhorn World Championship recently in Pontiac, Michigan. Eight seconds seemed like an eternity to Jim, whose bull tossed him off before the clock stopped. Liza Minnelli and ballet star Mikhail Baryshnikov are in New York now rehearsing for an upcoming television special. The pair will appear in a one-hour salute to the American Theater scheduled to air in late April on ABC. This will be the first time Baryshnikov and Minnelli have performed together on television. Well, school is out of Baltimore County for the Easter break, but uh, some Franklin High School students are involved in another kind of break this week. Kevin Brown and Instant Eye have that story. At 8 o'clock this morning, the Franklin band members sat down to play their music, something they've done dozens of times. But this time, they won't stop playing until Friday afternoon, more than 100 eardrum-shattering hours later. What are you doing this for? To raise money for new instruments, pretty much. And if we last long enough, we'll have a Guinness World Record. The longer the band plays, the more money its sponsors donate. The musicians do get a break from time to time, a whole five minutes every hour. What are you going to do for sleep? Oh, we get five-minute break every hour. So and in that five minutes, you sleep, eat, or whatever. It doesn't seem like much. Well, it isn't, but that's what we got to do. What are you going to do for sleep? Huh? What are you going to do for sleep? I ain't going to get any. <laughs> You're going to go all the way to Friday with no sleep? Yep. Can you make it? Yeah, I hope so. And what about the poor waitresses here at the Strawberry Patch? After all, they'll be here until Friday, too. What condition are your ears in right now? So far, they're all right. So far, now I got a headache. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to be able to stand this uh, another five days? If they can, so can I. Of course, they're one-third my age, but I'll manage. This whole thing involves a big commitment from these youngsters. Think about it. They'll be holding their horns and beating their bass drums for more than a hundred hours, making a lot of music now to make sure that next year there'll be more than the sound of silence. With Instant Eye, Kevin Brown, Channel 13 Eyewitness News. Well, I don't know, Albert. I think you're more from the cool school, uh, aren't you? Uh, well, just slightly, just slightly. I, uh, I'm used to hearing juice harps <laughs> in my big band music. You see. <laughs> that's not the cool school, but anyways. Well, well it's close. Yeah, I mean, right. that's the ultra cool school. <laughs> that's also our report at the moment. ABC's World News Tonight is next. I'm Al Sanders. And I'm Jerry Turner with the entire Eyewitness News team back tonight at 11 o'clock after the fights, including the WBC World Heavyweight Championship. I'm Judy Romack. The news doesn't stop now. I'll be out with Instant Eye covering news developments throughout the evening. For those breaking stories, tune in at 11 when Jerry Turner joins you with Eyewitness News.